are going to get into the 12th installment. Yes, the 12th installment of our Seek First series. We're looking at the theme of the Father's house this year and the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you're new with us today, our key text for the series is found in Matthew 6, where we read, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will give you everything you need. I hear people reading it with me. They made you do that last week. And so let's just do it again, shall we? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will give you everything you need. And for the last 11 weeks, we have learned what it looks like to be those who seek first the kingdom by living righteously and according to these teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And man, we've had a plethora of uncomfortable topics to discuss here, everything from rage and revenge and how to treat our enemies and secret sin and purity and, of course, forgiveness and divorce and all of the great things we thought would be a really great way to start out the year, talking about some really comfortable subjects. But today, I have the honor of, of talking about a subject that I personally feel is the most uncomfortable, way more than what Robin had to talk about. Um, <laughs> At least it is for me as the guy who has to communicate, because today we are going to be discussing the subject of money and possessions, what Jesus says in this Sermon on the Mount. A very appropriate Palm Sunday message, you know? Just figured money and possessions, why not on Palm Sunday? And let me just get this out of the way up front. I hate talking about this stuff. This is not my favorite subject. I know a lot of people assume pastors love talking about those things because a lot of pastors talk about them a lot. Uh, but while we do mention giving every single week here, uh, we've never done a series on the subject of money and possessions. And if this is your home church, you know that I could probably count on one hand the number of times we've even dedicated a whole sermon to that subject. And the reason I don't like talking about it is because the old adage is true. People get funny when you talk about money. They do. People get funny. And I don't want you to get funny. I, I, I like when we can laugh together and preach together and enjoy one another's company. I don't like it when you just stare at me with your judgy eyes and your arms folded. It's not fun for me up here, all right? But we would have to cut out a significant portion of the Sermon on the Mount if we wanted to ignore the topic of money and possessions. We'd have to eliminate a lot of things Jesus said. And while that might be comfortable for me, convenient for us, it would not be conducive in, in aiding us to become the kingdom people that Jesus has called us to become. So we're going to just shake it off a little bit today, embrace the collective discomfort together, and we're going to see what Jesus has to say about that subject. Sound good? Come on, sound good, 11 o'clock? All right, let's go for it. Matthew 6, 19, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break into your car downtown and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and Mammon. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, many of you have probably heard those scriptures before, especially if you've been in church for a while. Maybe you've heard a teaching or an exhortation on them. But here's what I believe is going to happen over the next couple of moments. Despite the familiarity of those scriptures, I think the Holy Spirit's going to breathe some fresh revelation on it for us. We're going to see things a little bit different before we leave today. So I'm going to pray. And before I do, let me give you a title for the note takers in the room. I'm going to title this in the form of a quote from a show that my parents did not let me watch when I was a child because they were very protective over my entertainment. But if your parents did not love you as much as mine loved me, you will recognize this quote. Uh, I borrow this from Bart Simpson, all right? We're gonna call this chat, don't have a cow. Don't, <laughs> I got people preaching me back with that phrase over here, all right? If that's all I get in interaction today, I'll take it. Turn to the person next to you, tell them, don't have a cow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pray and, uh, and ask, ask the, the Lord to speak to us today. Uh, Jesus, we love you, and we do thank you for the fact that you spoke to every area of our life. We don't have to have a bunch of question marks because everything we need for life and godliness is found here in the scriptures. And uh, although we've probably heard some teachings on this, and maybe there's even a, a, a bit of apprehension or, or nervousness as we approach this subject today, God, we just we hand our hearts over to you right now. 
We hand our, even our preconceived ideas and uh, past experiences and broken teachings we've heard about this stuff. We just lay it all at the feet of Jesus and we ask you to speak to us, transform the way we think about these things so that you can transform the way we live before we leave this place in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. So today we need to start the same way we've started a number of these sermons in this series. Uh, in order to fully grasp the, the, the weight of what Jesus is saying here about money and possessions, we need to start by looking at a few definitions, starting, starting with this word treasures that Jesus uses a number of times in each of these three scriptures. Uh, he, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures or uh, store up in heaven treasures and where your treasure is there, your heart, your heart is also. He says that a couple of times. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word treasures, I immediately begin to think of pirates. That's where my head goes. Probably because there's a child up here somewhere, but I, I, I begin to think of like treasure chests and jewels and gold and Johnny Depp. Like that is where my head goes when I see the word were treasures. And, and perhaps that is why when I started studying this week, I immediately recalled a text I'd gotten from a friend a couple of months ago who sent me a link to a, a translation of the Bible that I did not know existed. Apparently it's relatively new, but someone had so much free time on their hands that they created the pirate translation of the scriptures, what the Bible would sound like if a pirate was reading it. And I thought, what better way to start out studying the word of the Lord than to see how a pirate would say it. Maybe God will give me some fresh revelation. So I offer to you today the pirate translation of our scriptures, just for your own edification as we jump in. Uh, it says, army hearties, don't be storing your treasures where moth and rust can devour them and where thieves break in and plunder. Nay, store up for yourselves treasure in Davy Jones' locker where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure be, there your heart be also. <laughs> I'm available for birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, quinceañeras, whatever you need. I'm here to serve. So, okay. Maybe you're like me, and when you hear treasures, that's where your head goes. You begin to think about gold and treasure chests, and if so, then you might actually be a Greek scholar, because that is very appropriate imagery to assign to the words of Jesus here. In the original language, when he uses this word treasures, it is the word thesaurus, thesaurus, not to be confused with thesaurus, which of course is a very articulate dinosaur. Um, oh, come on. These are the jokes, people, all right? This is what you get. Sorry. <laughs> Dad jokes for days. Thesaurus. And it means the place in which good and precious things are collected and laid up. So not the things themselves, but the place that they are laid up. Think storehouse, coffer, receptacle, or yes, even perhaps a treasure chest. The place where things are stored, not the things themselves. What's interesting about this word is the way that Jesus uses it here in the text. When we read it in the English language, we see this phrase three times. Don't store up treasures on earth, store up treasures for heaven, where your treasure is there, your heart is also. We see it three times. But if we were to read this in the original language, we would actually see that Jesus repeats this word twice in each of those three statements. If, in fact, if we were gonna read it in the Greek, it would read like this. Thesarizo, do not store up for yourself, thesaras, storehouses. So maybe a better way of, of wording this in the English would be, do not store up storehouses here on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Now, now that might seem like a really irrelevant detail. You're like, thank you for that. I don't care. Like, what does that mean? Why are you getting so detailed here? I actually think that when we understand what Jesus is saying here about storing up storehouses, it serves as proof to, to debunk many of the bad teachings that are out there about money and possessions. Because Jesus is not saying here you can't have anything nice. He's not saying don't, don't ever enjoy life or enjoy a, a nice vehicle or go on a vacation or have a retirement account or, or a savings account. That's not what he's saying. No, there's a lot of people out there that believe that godliness is found in selling all your possessions, giving everything to the poor, and that true Christians should never have anything, and that they should just be these people who live by faith and never have a retirement account and all of that kind of stuff. There's some teaching out there about that, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. In fact, if he was saying that, he'd be contradicting some of the other scriptures in the Old Testament. Scriptures like the godly will inherit the earth. 
God actually wanted his people to be a display of his glory by the way that he blessed them. And not just in some figurative, ethereal way, but even with the literal, physical blessings, he wanted the nations to look at his people and say, their God is the real deal. And there's a lot of teaching about financial wisdom in the Proverbs and how we shouldn't just show up to retirement without anything and hope that someone else is gonna take care of us. In fact, Proverbs says, store up an inheritance for your children's children. Like be so wise that even your grandkids are blessed as a result of what you do here on earth. So to be clear, this, this is not what Jesus is saying. Now has he called some people to a life of poverty? Absolutely. Could he call you to sell all of your possessions and give your money to me? Absolutely, he could call you to do that. It's possible. But that is not what he's teaching as a universal truth here in the text. To be clear, Jesus has no problem with followers having some nice things, having a savings account, a retirement, going out on, on some vacation. He's totally fine with all of that. Here's where it becomes a problem. When those things have you. When you spend the entirety of your life trying to amass more for yourself, building up storehouses on storehouses of stuff in this life, where your chief aim and everything you focus your passion and your attention on is accumulating more for yourself to the neglect of the kingdom, never investing in eternity. In the same way that we should all be concerned about the season of life where we're gonna retire one day and we don't wanna show up there and go, I have nothing, even more, we should be aware of the fact that we are all gonna stand before Jesus in eternity and we do not want to show up to heaven empty-handed because we never invested in the kingdom. That's what he's saying here. Okay, four people agree with me, so I'm gonna teach on this a little bit more. Let, let me say what I've said many times before and I will say as long as there's a microphone in my hand and this is my community. Let me remind the Father's house today, this life ain't it, people. Eternity is coming whether we like it or not. The 80 or 90 years we get here on planet Earth, it is gone in a breath, like a puff of smoke, the scriptures say. We are here one day and gone the next. And before you know it, we are all gonna be standing before Jesus at that great white throne, and we will be giving an account for the life that we lived here on Earth. And that account will include the way that we invested the resources, the money and the possessions that he entrusted to us to steward on this Earth. And, and many are gonna show up on that day empty-handed with nothing to show because they've invested so much of their life in the temporary things of here and now. And I can't speak for you, but I will speak for myself. I do not wanna be one of those people. I don't wanna show up empty-handed to eternity because I was obsessed with what this life had to offer. No, I wanna serve my king and build the kingdom of Jesus Christ here on earth and make sure that my investments are stable in heaven so that when I stand before him, he looks me in my eyes and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy that has been set before you. You sought the eternal things and not the things that this earth had to offer. That's what I'm living for, and that's what many of us are living for. And, and that is the, the invitation here in the text, to invest in eternity and not in the temporary things of here and now. But that invitation is also coupled with a warning, a warning in the form of a, a test that Jesus issues at the conclusion of these statements that help to reveal whether or not we are invested in the right place. After he tells us that, that we should invest in eternity, how we should invest in eternity, he, he makes this, this statement. It's such a powerful phrase, but he says, let me remind you where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, your treasure is telling you something. Your money and your possessions are communicating something to you. They are telling you who has your heart. I heard one pastor say, show me your budget and I will show you your heart. That's a convicting statement for sure. I'm not as mean, so I would like to word it like this. The way I think of it is, your treasure has your heart on a leash and it's taking you somewhere whether you realize it or not. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter four, uh, verse 23, he said, guard your heart above all else for it determines the direction, the course of your life. Condition of your heart determines the direction of your life. Well, Jesus expounds on that here. And he says, yes, the heart does determine the direction of your life. However, your heart is tethered to your treasure. Your treasure is ultimately determining the direction of your life because where your heart is invested, 
that's where you're going, whether you like it or not. But here's the good news. The good news is that he also tells us we get to choose whose hand is on the other side of that leash. We get to choose our own master. If we recognize the temporal nature of the here and now, and we invest wisely in the things of heaven while we're here on earth, then we can be confident that the king holds the leash to our heart and he is leading us in the right direction. If, however, we get so enraptured in the things of this world and all of our storehouses are spent here, then he tells us that we have willfully chosen to serve a different master, a master that he calls mammon. Mammon. Now look again at what he says here in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, he says, for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. So, so Jesus says that when we store up treasures here on earth, storehouses of treasures here on earth, that we neglect eternity and in so doing, we allow this master called mammon to lead our lives. And I don't want to freak anybody out, but you do not want mammon to lead your life. That is not a master you want. Because Jesus is not using analogous or figurative language here. This is not imagery. He's speaking to a spiritual reality that we all need to be aware of. Second definition for the day, this word mammon in the original language, it literally means the deification of wealth or material possessions. The deification of wealth or material possessions. In other words, mammon is an idolatrous spirit that we permit to lead our lives when we make money and possessions our God. When, when we say, you lead me, you determine my passions, you determine my direction. I know it looks like inanimate objects. It's just a car, it's just a savings account, it's just a this, it's just a that. But Jesus says, if we're not careful, those things can become our God. And if that sounds like really extreme language, consider here the, the quote from Nicky Gumbel, the founder of Alpha and the pastor of Holy Trinity Brompton in the UK. Look, look at what he says. Money has all the characteristics of a God. It seems to offer security, freedom, power, influence, status, and prestige. It is capable of inspiring devotion and single-minded preoccupation. Yet, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, our hearts have room only for one all-embracing devotion, and we can only cleave to one Lord. That's a powerful statement right there. And I think if we're honest and we, we survey our culture, I think we would all agree, yeah, that's a reality. It, it is very easy to make money and possessions our God, to say, you're going to lead my decisions. I'm going to spend my life working for you. It, it is very easy to make mammon your God. But, but while our culture proves that this is true, the deification of wealth and possessions is not a new problem. This is not a modern day issue. This has a, been a problem for, for a very long time, centuries, dare I say. In fact, you can find it in scripture. M remember the story all, all the way back in Exodus chapter 32? Uh, God has now delivered the Israelites from Egypt. They are a free people after Moses told Pharaoh to let God's people go and they're in the desert on their way to the promised land. They, they, they've now experienced freedom, but. God has called Moses up to the top of Mount Sinai and he begins to give him the Ten Commandments and these new rules for the sovereign nation to be established. But while he's up there, the people get impatient because he's gone for quite a few weeks and they come to Aaron and they're like, hey, Aaron, um, we don't know what happened to Mo. He's been gone for a few weeks and uh, we need a God to lead us. So we want you to make us a God to lead us from this place. And because Aaron's an idiot, he obliges and he tells the people to bring all of their gold to him. And after he gets all of the people's gold, he, he melts it down and he begins to cast it into an image, an image that looks something like this. Now, I was gonna spray paint this guy gold, but I realized if I did, it would just look like a gold blob up here. So I kind of had to bling him out a little bit just so that we knew that this was a golden cow. But, but you all get the picture, right? Okay. So, so, so Aaron melts down all the people's gold and he makes this, this cow 
an image of their own making. And Exodus 32 says that the people bow down before this cow and they begin to say, you are the one who led us out of Egypt. You are the one who delivered us and you are the one who's gonna lead us from this place on. And they begin to bow down to the image they created. Now, now Moses gets ticked. He hears from God what's happening down in the valley and he comes down and breaks the Ten Commandments and he makes the people eat their cow in a very vengeful fashion. You can go back and read it on your own time. But for the sake of our conversation today, there's a detail in this story that I want us to consider. Maybe you've never considered before. Let, let me ask you. Where, pray tell, did these Israelites get all the gold to make this cow? Last I checked, they were slaves in Egypt, and slaves in Egypt were not known to have items of great value in their possession. So where did all these former slaves get the gold to make their God? And we get the answer to that in Exodus chapter 12. As Moses is leading them out of Israel, look at what it says. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for, artic for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. Where did they get the gold? They got the gold from God. God made the Egyptians favorably disposed to the people. The gold came as a gift from God. It was literally a blessing that he poured out on his people. But instead of the people worshiping the God who gave them the gift, they worshiped the gold and made the gift their God. They worshiped the blessing instead of the blessor. Sure sounds like mammon to me. It might look like a harmless cow, but it's a big, fat, juicy slice of mammon right there. A God of their own making. So, so perhaps there's no better time than the present to ask one of those fun questions we so love to pose here from the stage at the Father's house, forcing us to personalize all of this content lest we point our fingers at a bunch of Israelites in a desert making cows thinking we wouldn't do the same thing. So, so, so let me ask you a question today. Do you have any cows in your life? Have you made any gods lately? <laughs> As you survey the landscape, better yet, the pasture of your life, is there any lowing of cattle out there? Things that are getting the attention, the passion, the desire that only God should be getting. Have you made the gift a God? And to be clear, I don't think that anyone here is in danger of melting down your jewelry and making a life-size cow. If you have that much gold, come and talk to me after the service. I can tell you a better way to use it, all right? But, but I don't think any of us are in danger of melting it down and making gods for ourselves. But I think all of us are capable, capable dare I say quite proficient, at making gods of the gift. Worshiping the blessing instead of worshiping the blessor. I pray with a lot of people who are trying to get pregnant. That's a common theme sometimes at the altars. And like, hey, we're ready to start our family. Would you pray for us as we step into that? Or we're having a hard time getting pregnant. Will you pray with us? And we pray. And often God will answer that prayer and bring somebody a child. But it's amazing to me how that little baby can become the cow that the family bows down to instead of the God that gave them that blessing in the first place. It's amazing how weeks and months and sometimes years can go by and the family just completely disappears from church. And then they wander in one day and like, hey, where you been? I haven't seen you. And they're like, oh, well, you know, nap time. You know, nap, nap happens in the mornings at the 11 o'clock service, so I can't come to church anymore because we gotta honor the baby's nap time. And so one day when they're not napping anymore, then, then we'll start honoring God with our Sundays again. But then the kid's not napping anymore and suddenly they still can't come to church because now there's soccer on Sunday and there's football on Sunday and there's basketball on Sunday and all the sports that they've signed their kid up for so they bat under the God of sports instead of the God that gave them the kid in the first place. And then, oh, I can't serve anymore. I can't be a part of the group anymore because, well, you know, during the week we got extracurricular activities for the kid and 
and we got that stuff going on every night of the week and we just need to rest a little bit. So maybe I'll get into a group when the kid is a little bit older. Oh, I can't give to the church anymore because I got to pay for private school and I got to pay for all the sports I signed up the kid for. And suddenly your kid has become a cow. You bow down to the blessing instead of the one that you came down to these altars and asked for. The kid becomes the God. Or how about the job? People pray for breakthrough in their employment or they want the promotion and they pray for God to open up the door and we agree and we fast and we pray and God opens up the door. And then suddenly that job becomes the God. It gets their passion. It gets their attention. It gets their focus. Their prayer life slips away and the word slips away and the service slips away because all of their mind is consumed with the job that they ask God to give them. And instead of building the kingdom, they're focused on building the company day after day. And maybe, just maybe, their talents become the leftovers that the kingdom gets, but the best of their time and the best of their talents is invested in the career to build the things of this life to the neglect of the kingdom. Just another cow. It's quiet. Or people pray for the the mate, the man, the woman, the girl, the guy. I just want me a man. And God hooks you up, gives you what you asked for. But it's amazing how that relationship becomes the God that you bow down to now. It gets all of your time, all of your passion, sometimes all of your money. It gets everything. And God gets nothing. He sent you the thing you asked for. Or even worse, that gift gets your intimacy. Your purity was reserved for the king at first. I'm going to hold myself unto the Lord. But the second he gave you the gift, now you begin to share parts of yourself that should be reserved for marriage, but you're bringing them into the bed prematurely. And they get your affection. They get your intimacy. And God's like, I get get nothing. I, I brought you that gift to begin with. Before you know it, you just got another cow in your life. Not to call your girl a cow, but you get what I'm saying today. And yes, of course, in the vein of what we're speaking of, this is abundantly true of our resources and our possessions as well. We ask God to open up the windows of heaven and to bless us financially, and he does. And then, man, we don't even honor him with the tithe, with a tenth of what he's given to us to say, God, I trust you as the source and not the government and not my employer. But instead, we take that and we fashion our own little cows We make cars and stuff and more clothing. We build up storehouses of inflated retirements and savings accounts and a whole bunch of other bull. (laughs) It's the truth. We are very good at making gods of the gift, deifying the blessing to the detriment of the blessor. We're really good at that. But I think if Jesus was standing on this stage today, he would look every single one of his followers in the eyes and he would say, guys, let me remind you, this life ain't it. Your job ain't it. Your kid, they're important, but they are not your God. Yes, I want to bless you. I want to pour out, but it is for a purpose. I'm asking you to give yourself not to this world, but to a kingdom that is above this world, to seek it first and not your own well-being first. And perhaps he would ask you to do what me and my dumb friends used to do back in our teenage days in Vacaville, Cowtown, AKA. If you find that there are some cows in your life, perhaps it is time to start tipping those cows over and saying, I refuse to let this world sit on the throne of my heart. I am not going to allow the the, the good things God has blessed me with to take his place of lordship in my life. No, I am seeking first the king and his kingdom, and that is my aim. That is where I'm fixing my eyes, and that is my focus until I see him in eternity. It's time to cow tip, people, in the spirit. Kick them over. And here's the deal. This is not a very difficult process. Tipping over cows is is very simple in our lives. So simple that that a caveman could do it. So simple that 
I think as I say this, you're going to feel like I didn't have an ending for the sermon. So I just wanted to tie a quick bow on it so that we could go drink coffee and eat donuts. It's that simple. All right. So, so, so ready? Buggle up. Here it is. The deep, heavy revy for the day. All right. How do you tip cows? Love God. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> I get it. That's insultingly simple. Love God. That's, that's, that's what all your years have, have, have gotten us. Love God. Okay. But, but, but look again at what Jesus says here in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. R- write this down if you're taking notes. This is not going to come up on the screen. Loyalty is the fruit of love. You want to be loyal? You want to be devoted? It starts with love. I am not loyal to my wife, Robin, because of some contractual agreement we made when we signed a marriage certificate almost 20 years ago. I'm not loyal to Robin because I'm afraid of what she might do to me if I'm not. Maybe a little bit, but <laughs> refer to a previous sermon in this series. But, <laughs> but that's not my motivation for loyalty. I'm loyal to her because I love her. I'm loyal to her because I've given my heart to her and her alone on this planet. I'm not interested in being married again. This first one's pretty tough. (laughs) But I'm loyal to her because I love her. And if we are going to be loyal to Jesus, if we are going to be devoted followers that seek first the kingdom and store up treasure for eternity, it is not going to be because we're afraid of what God might do to us if we don't. It's not going to be because we made some kind of contractual agreement at the end of a sermon one day where we said, Jesus, come into my heart and I promise I'm going to serve you all my days. No, it's because we love him. It's going to be because of love. If you love, you'll give. If you love, you'll serve. If you love, you will do anything that he asks you to do because your heart is fully devoted to him. It starts with love. Last story, and we'll conclude with this. I'll invite the worship team to come. One day, Jesus is, is on his way to Jerusalem, and as he's walking, this guy comes running up to him, and uh, he, he falls down on his face. He begins to bow down to Jesus and worship him. The Bible calls him the rich young ruler. And, and as he's worshiping Jesus, he, he, he asks him this question. He says, good teacher, what is necessary for me to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to this man in a number of the Gospels, but we're going to read it in Mark's account. He says this in Mark 10. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. You know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and he loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then here's our phrase again. And you will have treasure in heaven. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Then Jesus said, come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had a cow, because he had great wealth. We know that this guy saw Jesus as the Messiah. He acknowledged the deity of Jesus. We know that because he fell down on his face and he began to worship him and he called him good. In fact, Jesus affirms this when he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Translation, I recognize that you see me as God. You're calling me God. You know who I am. But here's the problem. Your lips are saying one thing. You're calling me God, but you've actually got another God in your life. Your heart is is tethered to another master, and we need to talk about this. And Jesus attempts to reveal this to the man through his response. He comes to the man, and after being asked about what must be done to obtain eternal life, he begins to quote some of those 10 commandments that Moses got on Mount Sinai when the Israelites were having a cow down below. He says, okay, well, you, you, you can't kill. Don't, don't have an affair. 
do not steal, do not lie, do not envy, honor your father and mother. But then he stops right there. He stops at six. Now, I may not be the brightest bovine in the pasture, but I think there's some more commandments. <laughs> Four, if I'm doing math correctly. <laughs> so, so Jesus, what happened to those other ones? The I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other God but me. Or, what happened to the don't make for yourself any idols? Where, where are the other commandments, Jesus? For, for a moment, it, it seems like Jesus forgot some of his own commandments. Kind of a momentary lapse. Like, uh, I feel like there's more. But, but what might feel like a forgetful omission, I think is a very intentional lesson he's trying to teach this guy. See, see the commandments can be divided into two general categories the relationship with God and the relationship with people. That's why Jesus said the entirety of the law and the prophets can be summed up in these two statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Even simpler, love God, love people. That's the whole law right there, summed up in two phrases. Love God, love people. What's interesting is that when Jesus responds to this man, he only mentions the love people commandments. He talks about the relationship between this man and humanity, but he doesn't mention any of the love God commandments. The reason he doesn't mention the first four is because the first four have to do with our heart being surrendered to God. As if to say, hey bro, I hear what you're saying. I see you bowing down before me. I see you acknowledging that I am God. You're telling me you love me and you wanna follow me, but we both know that there's some cows back at your house. We both know that there's another God that you have given your life to. And if you're going to follow me, you can't have two masters. You cannot serve God and money at the same time. You can't have a king and a cow. And so I am telling you right now, if you're gonna follow me, you have to make a decision. Are you gonna follow the Messiah or are you gonna follow mammon? You can't do both, you choose. See, contrary to popular belief, this was not simply Jesus trying to get this man to, to give all of his stuff away. It, it, this was not forced generosity, twisting his arm as, as if giving everything away was a prerequisite to being a disciple. Jesus did not require that of anybody else who was his disciple. He didn't tell Matthew or Peter or any of the rest of those guys they had to sell everything, but he told it to this guy. Why? Because he needed this man to understand that loyalty is the fruit of love. If you're going to be mine, it starts with love. And right now you love some other things more than you love me. And the scriptures say that as a result, this man went away sad because he had great wealth. He went home, and cuddled up with his cow because he didn't want to lose his stuff. May that not be the story of anybody in this room today. I believe better things for the Father's house. I don't want anybody to leave here today with their face hanging low because we are unwilling to deal with some stupid sacred cows in our life. As the writer of Hebrews said, I believe better things for this community. And so I conclude this morning with the simple phrase of our title, Father's house, don't have a cow. Do not allow the things of this life to captivate your heart and your attention and your passion. I know the world feels overwhelming and I know the culture is peddling its own gospel of amassing more for yourself. But may you see in the spirit today that there is something beyond this life that you've been called to invest in. May we be people that do not store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but may we be single-minded about everything that Jesus has given us. There is only one King worthy of our worship and his name is Jesus. And we will be a people. As for me in this house, we will fix our eyes on Jesus and we will recognize that everything that's been given to us is to be stewarded for his glory. We are not living for the here and now, we're living for eternity. So he will get our time, our talents, our resources, and everything else he hands to us on this side. So that when we stand before him, we get to hear those coveted words, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy that's been set before you. Amen? Amen, Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that 
no subject was off limits to you and that you were faithful to, to tell us everything we needed to know for life and godliness through this book. I know that the subject matter of money and possessions can be a weird one in church, but God, we, we, we come today to, to you at the conclusion of this word and we just, we ask that you would address any of the, the cows that we have in our life, any of the things that we have begun to worship instead of the one who gave them to us. May we see the totality of our lives as the evidence of your goodness. And may we not worship the goodness, but may we worship the God who gave it to us. May we be single-minded in our devotion, single-minded in our preoccupation, single-minded in our pursuits. May we love you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. And, and today, maybe you're here, and I know it's a weird message to, to give an altar call like this for, but um, maybe you're far from God today. Maybe you find yourself at a distance from Him, and I love what that scripture said a moment ago in Mark, where as Jesus looked at this man who was telling the Messiah all the things that he did to inherit eternal life before Jesus said anything else to him it said this that Jesus looked at him and he loved him he loved him you know where this whole journey starts loving God starts with recognizing that he loved you first so we're going to celebrate next weekend that Jesus came put on flesh lived a perfect life for 33 years, died a death that all of us deserved on a cross and resurrected on the third day so that you could walk into a church building on a Sunday morning and you could hear the good news about salvation and respond by saying, Jesus, you loved me first. And in response, I love you. I give my life to you. And so today I ask if you're here this morning and you're far from God and you need to respond to the gospel. You need to give your life to Jesus. I think about a dozen people did it the first service, which was weird to me in a sermon like this. But if that's you today, I just want you to know the Holy Spirit is calling people, yes, even in the midst of this kind of content. And I wanna pray with you, a very simple prayer of commitment. But before I do, no one's looking around, eyes are closed, heads are bowed, but would you just boldly shoot up your hand and look at me and say, that's me, Tim. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Did I got you there in the back? Yeah, thank you, bro, right here, awesome. Yeah, right over here, cool. Thank you, got you in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else over here today? Hallelujah. Oh, I'm sorry, I got you. Thank you, thank you. All right, here's what we're gonna do. Out loud, we're gonna pray with all of these making a decision so they don't feel alone. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I thank you for giving yours for mine. I choose to follow you and to be your disciple. Forgive me of my sin. And help me to walk in your ways from this day forward until I see you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's clap and celebrate for all those people making that decision today. Hallelujah.